right, go to the book of John tonight, chapter 21. John chapter 21 tonight. Some of what I'm going to be covering tonight, it kind of goes along a little bit with this morning's message, some of the things that we covered. But uh, I want us to re- start reading in John chapter 21, and I'll show you, uh, tell you what I'm going to be preaching about tonight. John 21, verse 15 says, So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he had said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But that when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldst not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved, following, which also leaned on his breast at supper, and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren that the disciples should not die. Yet Jesus said unto him, said not unto him, he shall not die. But if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? This is the disciple which testifieth of these things and wrote these things. And we know that his testimony is true. So right here in the story, we, you all know the story. Jesus, or Peter, he had denied Jesus three times. And then most people believe that's why three times Jesus asked Peter, Peter, do you love me? I don't know if he's given him a chance to make up for it or what, but after he does this, you know, Peter gets grieved after the third time <clears throat> that Jesus asked him this. And then after he answers it for the third time, Jesus basically tells him he's going to be martyred, that he was going to glorify God through his death. And so, uh, and when Peter hears this, his immediate, you know, and Jesus, after he tells him this, he says, follow me. And then Peter, when he hears this, you know, he doesn't say, you know, Lord, I don't want to die. You know, he does, you know, you would think that would have kind of concerned him when he found out that he was in fact going to be die, uh, that he was going to die, that he was going to be uh, carried whether he would not, you know, in other words, he's, you know, he's going to be killed. He's going to be put to death. He's going to be martyred. And this is just kind of a side note here, but these people too that preach that Peter was looking for the coming of Christ in his lifetime, forget about the fact that no, he wasn't because Jesus told him that he was going to be martyred. Therefore, the rapture could not come before Peter got martyred. Just kind of some common sense right there. But anyway, so he hears this. Oh, you'd think he'd get concerned about that, but what does he do? He looks over at John. What shall this man do? I have to die? What is he going to do? And Jesus tells Peter, if I would that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow me. I think that was basically Jesus' way of saying, Peter, mind your own business and follow me. And you know what? The title of my message tonight is, you know what? Mind your own business and follow Jesus. Just mind your own business and follow Jesus. One of the biggest mistakes Christians make in their lives that get them off track is they get focused on on what other Christians are doing or not doing. You know, they get focused on things that are none of their own, none of their business, and they end up getting their eyes off Christ. And sometimes, you know, God is going to ask things of us that aren't necessarily pleasant. They are things that maybe go against our flesh, but when this happens, we have to have the faith to follow him, okay? Jesus telling Peter, you're going to be martyred, you're going to be put to death. That's going to go against what your flesh wants, doesn't it? Does anybody here want to die right now? Okay, you know, anybody want to be executed right now? No, we don't want that, do we? But Jesus told Peter, you know what? That's going to happen to you, but you know what? 
follow me. Sometimes he asks things of us. The Bible requires some things of us that just go against our flesh. Things that we are not going to want to do. You're not, sometimes you're not going to feel like coming to church. Sometimes you're not going to feel like reading your Bible. You're not going to feel like giving your tithes and offerings. You're not going to feel like going out soul winning and witnessing to somebody. You might not always feel like acting like a Christian. You might not feel like talking like a Christian. You might not feel like you know having a good testimony sometimes. You're not going to feel that way. But you know what? God has asked us to do that. And that is one of the ways that we follow him. But sadly, because we let's just be let's just be honest tonight. All right, take your halos off. All right, get rid get rid of your halos and just admit it. Okay, we don't like always doing everything that God has called us to do. You know, there's a lot of things I do because I believe I'm supposed to do them, not because I like doing it, but I believe I'm supposed to, and so I do it anyway. And what ends up happening many times because let me tell you the bar. For, you know, what you need, you know, has been set so low on what is expected of Christians today. I mean, it, it is so, so low that it is not uncommon for you to go to a church and people to just not be very good Christians and people not be living very good lives. The people who are just kind of giving themselves over to the flesh, you know, they just kind of do what the flesh wants. They come to church just enough to ease their conscience. They live lives that are little better than the world so they can feel like they're, you know, decent Christians. You know, they're not quite as good as, you know, those real uh, arrogant people in the church, those pious people that think they're better than everybody. You know, they're, they're just kind of these middle of the road people. They're not the worst person in the church. They're not the most liberal person in the church. So they feel like they're okay with where they're at. But then, you know, sometimes the preachers, he gets up and he starts preaching the truth and that people get convicted and, They go ahead and they do what they're supposed to do. They go against the flesh and they do what God wants them to do. But then something starts to happen. They learn, you know what? The Lord wants me to go to church. He wants me to give. He wants me to dress right. He wants me to act right. And then you know what they do? They'll start doing it, but then they start looking at all the other Christians that aren't doing it. And then it's like, wait a minute. What about them? What about these people? And you know what? There's many areas where this is going on. Preachers today, this kind of goes along with what I was preaching a little bit this morning, are literally perverting the gospel just because I believe of jealousy of their brothers and sisters in Christ. What are you talking about? Well, I mean, I listened to a preacher here just recently that was kind of bashing, you know, the door to door soul winning, bashing easy believism. Because you know what? There's no way that those people that you went and gave the gospel to and they prayed and asked Jesus to come in their heart and they didn't go to church the next day, didn't completely change their lives, there's no way those people are saved. There's no way they're, you know, there's no way they're my brother and sister in Christ. But you know what? If they believed on Christ, they are your brother and sister in Christ. And listen, you all remember when you were a kid, and if you have kids, you know this too. Didn't you always hate it when your parents told you you couldn't do something and then you saw your brother or sister doing that very thing? I mean, that always creates chaos in the house, doesn't it? You know, mom, why are they doing this? You told me I can't do it. And then what do kids usually do immediately? They go and they tattle. They go tattling on their brothers and sisters. Why? Because they're jealous. They wanted to do that. They wanted the last cookie and you told them they couldn't have it. And then they see their brother or sister eating the cookie And they get mad because they wanted the cookie. And so what do they do? They can't be glad their brother or sister got the cookie. You know what do they do? They go tattle because they're mad. And you know what? Let's just be honest. These repent of your sins preachers that get up and bash everybody that's not as holy as they are. They need to just admit the fact that, you know what? You're still just as rotten as you were the day you got saved. You got a dirty, nasty attitude because the truth is, You're jealous because you know what? You're in church and you'd rather be home watching the football game like they're doing. You're dressed up all nice, but you're mad at them because they get to dress like the world dresses. And so you've got a problem that you're jealous. And you know what you, you know what they do? They go, it's like they're tattling to God. You know, Lord, how come you're letting them get away with that? 
You know, Lord, why, how come there, how come judgment's not raining down on them? And then what, what is it that usually happens too? Every kid will tell you this too. You know, my brothers and sisters, they all do this and nothing happens. Then I say, you know, I do one thing and then man, mom and dad come down on me. And you know what? We do the same thing too. Well, fine. Everybody else is skipping church to go watch a football game. You know what? All the liberal churches out there, they're all canceling services on Super Bowl night. You know what? Nothing's happening to them. You know what? We're going to do it. Next February, whenever we're canceling for Super Bowl, and you know what? If we did that, we'd have a church split after that. You know, something really bad would happen. We wouldn't be here that night, and something would cause a fire to get started that we would have noticed before and put out, and then, you know, the church burnt down because we didn't have church in Super Bowl. Lord, and we'd be like, Lord, how come they didn't? How come they got away with it and we didn't? And we started tattling, and the truth that we, the thing we don't even realize is, you know what? The problem is we haven't even changed. We want to do the things that they're doing. You know, we're just jealous that they are actually doing what we want to do. Well, listen, if you are so saved, if you are so spiritual, if you are so holy, why do you want to do those things? And the truth is, you know, we are, we're, we're not as holy as we think, but they are, they're jealous. And so what do they do? They're just not saved. They're, they're just not saved. And, you know, and because and, what happens too? you know, you got, we call them pastor, but you know who the guys are behind pulpits these days, many times, we probably should be calling them father. Now I know the Bible says not to, but we treat these guys like their father and they're the boss and he'll, you know, and Pat, you know, some, listen, if you give some pastors an inch, they'll take a mile. And if you let some pastors tell you every little thing to do in your life, they'll tell you every little thing to do in your life. Okay. Me personally, maybe this was why I'm not the greatest pastor in the world, but you know, I don't want to micromanage, you know, some stuff's just none of my business. And you know what? I don't want to make all your decisions for you. All right. You know, don't, there's this, that's just not me. Some pastors are like that though. And you'll have one person in the church, you know, maybe you got brother Mark, man, he does everything I tell him to do. And it's not because he got led to that from reading the Bible. It's just, he fell for my preaching. Listen to your pastor. Pastor is authority over everybody in the church, and you know, boss over around, tell you what you do in your home. And so, what does he do? You know, him and his wife are having an argument. You know, hey, you know, we need to get this TV out of our house. You know, she likes watching TV, she's into the soap operas and stuff. And he can't make a decision, he doesn't got the you know, he's not man enough to lead his home. So, uh, well, let's go ask the pastor. And I'm like, yeah, get rid of that TV, that thing's a piece of garbage, get rid of it. And then now she's all upset. I mean, he's able to, oh, it was the pastor's fault. Well, then, you know, you got Brother Steve. You know, he's the head of his household. You know, he, call, he calls the shots there. And you know what? Maybe his, if his wife's watching soap operas, he needs to get rid of the TV too. But you know what? He just decides not to do anything. And so guess what's going to happen? I'm going to end up hearing about, you know what? How come Evan still have a TV? Pastor, you should be preaching on, against TV more than that. You know, and, and I'm telling you, this kind of stuff goes on. And now all of a sudden, Brother Mark's down on everybody in the church that has a TV because his wife's miserable because they had to get rid of theirs. And they, they don't do this stuff. You know, they had to get rid of theirs. And so now it's not fair. Everybody else in the church needs to be just as miserable as they are. And, you know, I know people like this. And it's like they do, you know, they want to go to the ch these churches that enforce all these really strict standards on everybody. And you know what you have in the churches like that? And listen, I am 100% for high standards. I hope you have them. You should have them. But the problem is when you start forcing these things on people, you end up creating the meanest, nastiest, spirited people in the world that are always tattling on everybody. And listen, I hate tattling. I, I, I All parents... Hate tattling. And we and the thing that we need to realize is you know, we're we're not supposed to be going around tattling on everybody. But preachers are, they get so tired of dealing with these things. Well, I gotta figure out how to get evidence to get rid of their TV, because otherwise I'm gonna have to keep listening to Brother Mark complain. Well, I tell you what, I don't know about a salvation that won't even get a television out of your home. Those of you that still got TVs, you know, I think you all better check your salvation. You all know what it says in the Bible. I will set no wicked thing before mine eye. Talking about that television set. And let me tell you something. 
lose a TV and thou shalt be saved. You know, I mean, they don't go, they don't go, they don't quite go that far. But you know what? It's I'm I'm only slightly exaggerating right now. I'm only slightly exaggerating, and I'm I'm telling you, these this this kind of stuff goes on, and then. Now everybody's doing things for the wrong reason. We talked this morning about how works don't save us. You know, it's faith that saves us. But now I've got everybody getting their act together. I've got everybody dressing right because they're thinking I've got to do these things to go to heaven. And nobody's doing it because they love the Lord. And guess what's going to happen if you ever go to another church or if I ever leave? Now all the pressure on you is off because it wasn't the Holy Spirit that prompted you to do these things. It was me. And you know what y'all are going to do? You're all going to go buy your TVs and do everything that you were doing before. And that happens all the time. And it's because, you know, jealousy of brothers and sisters in Christ, it ends up provoking them to sometimes pervert the scriptures. They can't stand how their brothers and sisters seem to get away with disobedience. You know, and they're angry because their brothers and sisters seem to be allowed to do the things that they want to do. Listen, you know, and it, it, they do. They talk about it all the time. These people that never changed obviously aren't really saved. Well, then how come if, you know, if, you know, if it's about a change, then wouldn't you not want to do those things anymore? But listen, once again, take your halos off. There's some things that the world does that we want to do, don't we? And, but we don't, we don't do it out, out of obedience to God, out of love for God. And it drives people nuts when they see other people calling themselves Christian doing that and they want to find a way to throw them into hell. That's just not how it works. If you want to do what the world does, it must be because you haven't changed. Is that right? Or maybe we want to do what the world does because we're made out of the same flesh that they're made out of. And we forget that folks. We are made out of the same flesh that they are made out of. What is different, what has changed, what has become new is we now have the Spirit of God living in us. And if we walk in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. All right, let me say that again. If you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. That therefore, that means our flesh must lust after things that it shouldn't. Y'all get that? And people are acting like if once you're saved, you shouldn't want to do those things anymore. Well, listen, the spirit of God that's, that's living in you is not going to want to do those things, but your flesh is going to want to do those things. Otherwise, why would the Bible tell us that we need to walk in the spirit so we won't fulfill those lusts? Why didn't it just say, get saved and you won't have the lust of the flesh? It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that anywhere. And the problem that we have today is some of our brothers and sisters in Christ are not walking in the spirit and they are fulfilling the lust of the flesh. And it just happens to be the same lust that we have. And you know what? Your flesh gets envious of that because you want to do it too. And therefore, what do we do? We start tattling. We become, we become the accuser of the brethren, just like the devil. Look at what they're doing. And, you know, we love hearing the this verse in the Bible about Jesus Christ being our advocate with the Father. And, you know, we love those things, but it's like, you know, it's okay. You know, he's only our advocate when we do things like miss church or maybe have a bad attitude or occasionally get angry, but not when we're just out of church, not when we're dressing like the world. You know, we do, we just, we all make up our own standards, our own rules. And we do, we just become tattletales. You know what? Watch this, mind your own business and follow Jesus. Who cares what our other brothers and sisters are doing? Listen, we want to try to reach out to them. We want to try to get them in church. We want to try to follow up on these people. We do that stuff. But listen, they're not always going to do what they're supposed to do. Some of them are not going to walk in the spirit and they are going to fulfill the lust of the flesh, the same lust that you have. And you know what? Don't get jealous. Mind your own business and follow Jesus. Those of us who are saved do good works. Because we love God, not because we have to. And I believe it's possible to be saved and not love God. Look what it says in 1 John. Turn over to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. Verse 19 says, We love him because he first loved us. 
If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this is the commandment uh, we have from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Now, people will take this passage here and they'll say, if you don't love your brother, you're not saved. But no, that's not what it says because if brother Mark's my brother and I don't love him, well, then how could I violate the commandment of not loving my brother? If I'm not saved, he's not my brother. Y'all get that? And the Bible saying if we say, it doesn't say if we're saved and we don't love our brother, we're not saved. It's saying if we say we love God and hate our brother, we're a liar. And there's people out there, you know, if we say we love God, but we're not keeping his commandments, we're lying. If you love me, keep my commandments. Not if you will be saved, keep my commandments. If we love him, we're going to keep his commandments. We're going to do what he says. If we love him, we're going to love our brother. It's impossible to hate your brother in Christ if he's not your brother in Christ. So obviously it is possible to hate someone that is is your brother in Christ. And if you do that, you don't love God. And that's why it says, you know, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commands. This is how we know we have love. Not how we know we're saved. How we know we have love. And so, you know, the, the truth is, There are many people out there, there are many brothers and sisters in Christ who they just don't love God. Well, you know what? That's not good. That's going to create problems in their life. There's children out there who don't love their parents and they displease their parents greatly. Well, listen, why wouldn't we love God? We should love God. And we ought to love our brothers. We ought to do right. We ought to keep His commandments. But I'm afraid many people, you know, they they just don't. But it doesn't mean they're not our brothers and sisters, does it? It does not mean that these people that are out there are still our brothers and sisters and preachers need to stop perverting the gospel, making repentance about turning from your sins, making salvation, making it, turning it into a works based salvation because they can't stand the fact there's people, their brothers and sisters out there doing things that they want to do and they seem to be getting away with it. And I say seem to be getting away with it, by the way, too. And so, you know, people who mess with the gospel like this, they're either not saved or they forgot how they got saved. Look at what it says in Galatians chapter 3. It said, I, I try not to be quick to throw people into hell. And I try to tell people when I do throw them into hell, verbally, you know, don't get offended. You're not going to stand before me at the judgment seat of Christ. But I'm sorry, when I read my Bible and I see certain things, I just can't help but thinking you're not saved. You know, and, but it, you know, if you know the Lord, if you think you're saved, all right, you know, trust in him. Don't trust in what I tell you. Trust in what the Bible says. But look what it says in Galatians 3, verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only what I learn of you, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Let me remind you of something. How did you get saved? Was it by the works of the law? Or was it by the hearing of faith? Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Hey, when you got saved, it was by faith, believing on Christ. Are you that foolish? These preachers that are up there talking like this, saying these people aren't saved, are they so dumb? Are they so foolish to think that they have been now made complete? By the flesh? These preachers that get up there, let me tell you about the change that took place in my life. You know, when I got saved, I was, before I got, I was a drunk. I was a drug addict. You know, I broke the law. I was a criminal. And boy, when I had that head on collision with the Holy Ghost. And let me tell you, it changed me. And I got saved. <laughs> yeah. Changed my life. Never looked back. I gave up that smoking. I gave up that drinking. I've never done it again. But they don't tell you about their donut addiction that they have now that they got rid of those things. But they do. It's like, man, look at where I'm at now, folks. 
Check out my suit. I'm preaching behind a pulpit. I'm preaching at this camp meeting. You know, I mean, look at all God has done in my life through me. Look at me, folks. Are you that foolish to think that you now have been made complete in the flesh? You think your obedience of the law is now somehow evidence of salvation? You got started out, right? You got started out in faith, but now you've turned it into the work of the law. Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith, even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Those who are the children of God, or the children of Abraham, spiritually speaking, are those who are of faith, not those who are of the works of the law. But what are these preachers, are they all doing? They're not keeping this work of the law. They haven't been, they're not in church. They haven't got baptized. They haven't changed their life. They haven't gotten got rid of their stuff. They haven't started singing the things I used to do. I don't do them anymore. You know, they're not doing none of that stuff. And therefore, those people aren't saved. Well, let me tell you, either those preachers aren't saved or they just forgot how they got saved. I'm not saying they're all lost, but I am saying if they're not lost, they forgot how to get saved. And they just better thank God. You don't lose your salvation just because you forgot how you got it. Have you ever got something before? I'm like, where did I get this? I think, you know, I, I, you know, every once in a while, you know, my wife will see like a mark on me or something, a bruise of cut. I'm like, where did that come from? I don't, I don't even remember. I don't know where that came from. And it's like, that's what it was a salvation with some people. They're so dumb. They're so foolish. They're, they're saved. They have salvation. How'd you get that salvation? It's like they forgot. They start talking about their changed life. They start talking about their obedience to the law. It's like they, they must have forgot. They forgot. They still got it. Just because, you know, if I, if I wait, you know, tomorrow you see a big bruise on my head and you ask me, man, how did you get that? I don't remember. It doesn't mean I don't have it. Just because I don't remember how I got it. It's, it's there. You know, and just because people forgot how they got saved doesn't mean they're not saved. It, but they definitely forgot. And anybody who preaches like that, if they are saved, they forgot how they got saved. And it is. It's a, it's a bunch of garbage. Christians need to understand we don't always know how God is dealing with others. And we don't need to. It's none of our business. We don't know what's going on in our brothers and sisters who are out there. We, we don't know what's going on in their lives. We don't know how God's dealing with them. We don't know what they're going through. We don't know what they're feeling. We don't know. And it's none of our business. God doesn't need to tell us. He doesn't need to let us know. You know what we need to do? We need to mind our own business and follow Jesus. Man, you know, I didn't want to come to church tonight. You know, I came anyway because I'm trying to get the blessings of God. And then so-and-so, they didn't show up to church tonight. And then they get a blessing. Lord, why did I even do it? Why did I even come? You know what? Mind your own business and follow Jesus. Who cares what other people in the church are doing or aren't doing? We're often, un many times I'm afraid we're just unsatisfied with how God deals with our brothers and sisters. It's like, no, Lord, you're not punishing them enough. Okay? Now, we've all done this before, too. Okay? You know, I, I hate to confess any of my sins, but, you know, my wife, when she was growing up, if one of her siblings was getting spanked, the other ones were usually all crying about it. In my family, when one of us were getting spanked, everybody was laughing about it. All right? And, you know, I remember, you know, there were times when, you know, it, there was those few times when my sisters were getting spanked and I wasn't. And man, I love those times. And you know, I remember, you know, I, it seemed like every trip home when I was little, we'd go to my grandparents, they lived a couple hours away, and we could not go there or come back without me getting in trouble in the car and getting, you know, pronounced judgment on when we got home. You're getting spanked when we get home. And, and almost every time I was included. But I remember there was always those rare occasions where it was the girls that were getting it when we got home and not me. And I would take great pleasure in that. And I remember there were some times when my sisters were about to get punishment carried out. And, you know, my parents, they'd spank us right there in front of, you know, in front of everybody. Now, my sisters would get spanked. And it wasn't even a very hard one. I was like, what? Come on. I was hoping for a good one. And it just, it didn't happen. It was weak and it was disappointing. That's, that's a terrible attitude, folks. You know, or, you know, and even with me, sometimes I, if I was going to get spanked and my sisters were present in the room, you know, I would try to pretend like it didn't hurt because I didn't want them to get the pleasure of seeing me cry. 
You know, I would they they let me have it, and there were there was a few times where just you know, and just try to act like you know, just go walk and act like nothing happened. I remember one time I had two of my friends over, and one of my sisters was being a sister. It was all her fault, and you know I, she was throwing stuff at me or something, and I said stop it, and so I was going to get spanked for it. I, that's how I remember it. I, I, but anyway, partially true. Uh, <laughs> and so I'm, I remember, Dad's like, "All right, you're getting spanked," and my my friends were there, and so he took me in the other room, and I was just like, "Man, you know, I, I was nervous. I thought, you know, I, I'm not crying. I'm not crying because it's embarrassing." And man. I think that was the hardest spanking I ever got. I think it only hit me once or twice. And it killed. I, I still feel it. I'll, I'll, I'll never forget it. And I remember, I was just like, I'm trying not to cry. And I went, and man, it was loud too, because I'm thinking they probably heard that. And I remember I went walking back in the living room, and I'm, I'm not crying. You know, I remember we were sat down in front of the TV or something, and they were just kind of looking at me with their eyes real big. And I'm just sitting there, just don't cry, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry. And they were like, are you okay? <laughs> and I'm just like, yes. And I started crying. And it, oh, it was humiliating, embarrassing. My sisters, they would get great pleasure in those things. That's a terrible attitude. It, you know, it was hard. I had a tough life. I had no brothers, four sisters. It was, it was a hard life. And you know, if any issues I have, it's, be, it's because of that. But anyway, that, we're that same way. We see our brothers and sisters in Christ doing things that we don't like and we don't feel like God spanked them hard enough. We don't feel like God did enough to punish them. We feel like we get punished much worse. You know what? We don't know what's going on. We don't know how God is dealing with them. What we need to do is mind our own business and follow Jesus. And you know, it, it, it's, no, it's none of our business. And if, if you know, our brothers and sisters aren't living for Him, we have no business saying they're not saved because of that. You have no business saying that. For not only is that none of your business, that is just factually wrong. And so we just you just need to shut up. You know, if if these these preachers that are just too lazy to go soul winning, you know, or just they can't get anybody in their church to do soul winning, they need to stop criticizing the churches that are doing it. And that are seeing, you know, large numbers of people get saved. They just need they need to mind their own business if they don't like it. And they, but they do. No, there's no way. You know, this should be happening. These people you know, just making ridiculous judgments. It's a bunch of garbage. I don't like it. And many preachers scoff at, at soul winning because they feel like it doesn't produce enough changed lives. But they need to mind their own business and follow Christ. What did Jesus say to do? He said, "Go into all the world." And preach the gospel to every creature. So, you know, you got these preachers too that criticize, you know, people if they go and they, you know, preach the gospel in some town somewhere where there's no church. They'll go on a mission trip to some other part of the world and they don't start a church. Well, man, it'd be great if we could start a church. It would be great if we went and started a church in Lanark. But you know what? We don't really have the capability of doing right now. So what are we supposed to do? Just let everybody go to hell until we're ready to start a church? How long is that going to take? That's just ridiculous. Why is it that they have a problem with that? You know, I'd love to get all those people in church. I'd love to have a church up there that we can tell people to go to. But you know what? Don't we believe you don't have to go to church to go to heaven? And so I would rather them maybe live a life on earth where they deal with some chastening from God because they're being disobedient children. I would rather them deal with some of that than... Deal with the wrath of God for all eternity in hell because they're not his children. It's just ridiculous. People's priorities are all messed up. And it's just absolutely stupid. They act like if you go and you get somebody to say, well, now you got them immediately in disobedience to God. Well, at least they're his children now and he'll deal with them in love instead of dealing with them in wrath. Just, it makes no sense. You know what? Let me tell you something. Our flesh is so lame, it's so pathetic. We are so naturally lazy that, you know what? We can make up pretty good sounding excuses for just not giving out the gospel. And that's exactly what they're doing. And they will. They can make their sorry congregation full of lazy people that would never put themselves out there, never go out there and, you know, uh, knock on someone's door. And they can make those people feel good about it real easy. Those people who maybe get convicted because of the people who are doing it, 
They can, you know, they, you know, they know how to ease their conscience. It's easy to do that. It's easy to appeal to the flesh and get the crowd on your side. But you know what? You're still wrong. You're still a liar. These camp meeting preachers that preach all this got to change stuff. Let me tell you, they get a lot more amens. If you go to some of these camp meetings down south where they preach the stupidity, they'll have people running around the auditorium teaching that stuff. That, that's ridiculous. You would think people get more excited about a salvation that's not based on our works. A salvation that's all about what Jesus Christ did. You'd think that would get them more excited than my changed life. But I could, you can get up, I could go down to one of these camp meetings and I could preach and I could lift up Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross and how that was full payment for our sins. And they'll sit there like a bump on a log. But if I get up there and I tell a dramatic story about how the Lord changed my life, boy, they'll be running around the building. It's, it's a joke, you know, and it's, it's ridiculous. These people just need to read their Bible. But Christ said, he told us to go in the whole world. And you know what? Well, what are those people going to do after we get saved? You know what? Just mind your own business and follow Jesus. He said, go in all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. You know, we'll, you know, do, what, do what you can. You know, the, the, and here's, I'm gonna, just going to reveal a dirty little secret to you. All right? I, I probably shouldn't do this. All right? you know, the Baptist mafia is going to come down on me for spilling the big secrets. But I'm, I'm going to reveal a dirty little secret that most people probably don't know. And that's, there's many things that preachers only preach on because of political pressure. A lot of what preachers are preaching today, especially in the area of standards, it's not because they believe these things by conviction. It's just whatever club they're in, this is kind of a required preaching. They're not preaching it out of conviction. This, it's 100% political pressure that motivates them to get up and preach these things. And many times in their churches, they have large portions of the congregation that are very carnal, that don't like to hear this stuff. And in many church, churches, the pastor has to find a way to enforce these things on them. And this is ultimately what causes everyone to start tattling on each other. Because, man, you know, I'd like to invite Dr. Big Shot to come down and preach at my church. But if he sees the way all my, you know, my con congregation dresses, man, he's one of these hardcore preachers on dress standards, you know. But I'd really like to have him in. It would move me up the ranks in fundamentalism, but I, I got to straighten all my women out first. You know, I got to get some guys' haircuts, furs. I, I, you know, what am I going to do? Uh, it's not just working, you know, preaching on love the Lord, keep his commandments. Uh, I'm going to have to throw them in hell if they don't do it. You know, and then they do and they do. They just start, you know, you're not, you're, you know, it's not really be saved if you don't do these things. Or one of the best enforcement methods that they use are, you know, the Christian schools and a lot of their fun programs and things they have. If you want to enjoy these ministries, you have to do this and this and this and this. And then they're able to get a big enough portion of the crowd doing things. And now I can have Dr. Big Shot come in and, hey, look at, look at my people, man. Look at the way they're all dressed. Look at how they all look. You know, am I in the club? You know, do I get my promotion? You know, and I'm telling you, that's why they do this stuff. And they are, and they do, they start enforcing it on people. They start, you know, the, the preacher, you know, he's, he's getting on people. And now they're dressing not in a way to please the Lord, they're dressing in a way to please the preacher. And then what happens? Here's brother so-and-so in the church. His family. They're not doing that stuff. And what do they do? They go tattling to the preacher. And man, I thank God I haven't dealt with that stuff here. Man, I thank God for that. I've done everything I can to try to keep that kind of spirit out of this church. But let me tell you all something, all right? Nobody in here is guilty of doing this, all right? So nobody can get offended by what I'm about to say. But I hate tattletales. I, man, I do. I just, I can't stand them. And you know what? Please don't do it. Don't ever start doing it. All right. Don't be a little tattletale. You know what? Mind your own business and follow Jesus and Christians. They need to stop tattling to their pastors about other people in the church. You know, revelation 12. That's where it talks about Satan. He's the accuser of the brethren. 
He accuses them for God. But the Bible says they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Well, folks, what is our testimony? It's not about our works, is it? It's about the work of Jesus Christ. But what does Satan do? He's still accusing them. Look what they did. Look what they did. But why is it we're able to overcome him? Because of the blood of Christ. The word of our testimony. Jesus paid it all. That's our, that is our testimony. And we forget that. And what do we do? We go, we're accusing everybody in the church. Preacher, Pastor, you need to preach on this subject. I saw so-and-so. I saw their family going into the movie theater. You need to preach on that. I saw them renting rent a bad movie. You, know, you need to preach on that. I saw this person doing it. You know, don't do that. All right? That's, that, is, that is so wrong. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, verse 1 and 2. It says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I'll see that. Yeah, that's all I care about. I, I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 6, verse 12. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. You know what? There's these people, these Judaizers, they came in. We need to have the people circumcised. Why are they doing that? Because they had this legalist group over there saying, no, they need to keep the laws and they were going to get criticized if they didn't have the people in their group getting circumcised. So what did they do? You know, they're just trying to put on a show so they wouldn't suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. What does that mean? Well, it's the cross of Christ that pays for all of our sins. That is our testimony. Jesus Christ, not look at my changed life. And you know what? Today, we still get criticized. Churches like us, preachers like me, we get criticized by these camp meeting preachers that are out there that preach this garbage, that preach against this easy believism stuff, that preach against this repent of your, you know, that preach this repent of your sin stuff. They preach against us. They criticize us. We suffer persecution from them for the cross of Christ. And it's because with these people, it is, it's all about the outward things and they're trying to put on the show. And then look at verse 13. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. What does that mean? These same people that are trying to make everybody do all these things just so they can look good, they're not keeping the law either. Yeah, they might be doing some of the things they told you to do, they might, you know, dress the way they tell you to dress, but you know what? There's still there's other laws they're breaking. There's other commandments they're not keeping. They're not keeping the law. Nobody's keeping the law unless you're keeping the whole thing, and nobody can do that. And so they are. There, it, it's phony. It's hypocritical. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. These crazy camp meeting people that are always screaming and yelling about a changed life, they're glorying in their flesh, in their works. And he says, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross. That's what should be getting us excited. That's what should get us fired up. But you know what? That's not it today. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy upon the Israel of God. Those who are just trusting in Christ. Those who are trusting in the cross. Those are God's people. That's Israel right there. That's the Israel of God. Not these people who are making a show in the flesh. And we need, we need to get that. We need to understand that. And so I'm sorry to reveal that dirty little secret. If you find out that you know my body was hacked into pieces or I'm laying at the bottom of a river in concrete shoes, it wasn't suicide, all right? It was the mafia, uh, the Baptist mafia. They came after me. But yeah, you know, don't, don't come give me reports about how you saw someone dressed out in public. You know what? Mind your own business and follow Jesus. You dress the right way. Don't come tell me about some good deed that you did and then give me a list of everyone who didn't do the same good deed. Mind your own business and follow Jesus. You know, you have these people, they'll, they'll, do, one, they'll do one good thing. They'll hear the message at one time. One time they do what they should do. And what do they want to do? They want to talk about everybody who didn't do it. That, you know, mind your own business. Follow Jesus. Some people are incapable of just reporting on what they do. 
they have to report on everyone else who's not doing what they do. Why can't you just do, your, do what God wants you to do? Why can't you just do the right thing and not give a rip about what everybody else is doing? You know, everyone has different priorities. There's some people in churches today, they're the health police. You know, I hate those people. You know, they see you drinking a soda or something. And you're like, hey, would you, know, would you like a Coke? Can I have water? And I'm trying to avoid sugar and caffeine and everything. So, you know, get away from me. You know, and I'm, try, I'm trying to honor the temple of God. You know, stinking organic vegetarian. I, 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 don't, I, don't like, I don't like those health police. But you know what? For some people, man, that's godliness to them. And if, listen, if you're all into health stuff, go for it. But, you know, don't bother me when you see me after church finishing off my cherry Dr. Pepper I've got in my fridge in there. I, I, don't, I don't want to hear about it. You know, you got some people, they're the clothing police. They are, they're down on everybody in the church that doesn't dress the way they think they should. Some people, you know, they're the church attendance police. You know, they, they're always keeping track. Eh, so-and-so hasn't been in church the last couple weeks. I, I, I've been here. Where are they? Hey, you know, it's, it, it's snow, you know, it's, it's the winter time. It's snowing out. Huh? Where's all those other, you know, how come these folks are, uh, they live closer to the church than I do. I still made it. Hmm. What are you looking for? Honorable mention from the pulpit. You know, Hey, you know, just mind your own business. And follow Jesus. You know, you've got the soul winning police, the giving police. You know, the, the labor police, they'll do a lot of the work. They're down. Everybody doesn't do that. You've got the music police. Pastor, I heard somebody driving down the road the other day, and I could hear the drum beat going in their car. I think you need to preach a message on rock music. You know what? You just keep listening to godly music. Mind your own business. Some people, they're the TV police. You know, we've all got our priorities. We all got our one thing where we're better than everybody else. That one thing where we have that really high standard so we can feel like we're superior to everyone else. You know what? Who cares about everyone else? What is that to thee? Follow me. Mind your own business. If what you're doing and how you live is truly based on the scripture and your love for God, you're not going to care what other people think or do. Hebrews 12 too. You're looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. What, what are we saying here? We're saying Jesus Christ, His Word, this is what tells me what I'm going to do. This is what I base my decisions on. His Word, He's the author, and He's the finisher. But what are most people today, if they hear a sermon on something, if they learn something from the Scriptures, well, what's everybody else going to do? Looking at everybody else. They are the author and finisher. You know why you see so many of the crazy you know, you see the crazy dress that's going on in the world, the crazy things people wear, the hideous hairdos, all these things. And you see people in the church doing it. And it's like, why are they doing that? You know why? Because everyone else is the author and finisher of what they do. They are the author of what they wear. They get caught up in every style and, and trend and fad and fashion that goes on. You know what? Look to Jesus. Let him be the author and finisher. And it won't matter what everyone else is doing. You'll just, you're just going to do it because you love God. And many Christians today are missing out on the blessings of God in their lives and in their churches because they are so focused on the lives of everyone else, of their, and many times of their backslidden brothers and sisters in Christ. And if we're going to be successful in this world, we need to mind our own business and follow Jesus. If I would that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow me. Mind your own business, Peter. Follow me. Yeah, what I told you to do, it goes against the flesh. Nobody wants to get killed. It goes against what, you know, it, go, it goes against that flesh. But you know what? Do it anyway. Some of the things that God has called us to do and commanded us to do, it's not really fun. It doesn't appeal to our sinful flesh. But you know what? Follow Him. Yeah, the world, Bible says the world's going to wax worse and worse. But you know what? I'm going to keep on doing the right thing. I'm, who cares what the rest of the world's doing? Mind your own business and follow Jesus. So with that